Hello everybody, I'm not going to be speaking very much about sustainability, nor about the environment, nor about green stuff, because that's what you're expecting. And the way to bore the pants off anybody is to tell them exactly what they expect. So I'm going to tell you about pigs, because pigs are good. I'm going to tell you my life story in three minutes. Okay, I went to Durham University to study archaeology and anthropology, and when I was at university I formed a rock band, and when I left university to become an archaeologist, I realised that I was going to earn no money at all as an archaeologist, but I might earn a lot of money being in a rock band. So I went to London and discovered when I was in London that there were 30,000 musicians better than me in London on any night of the week. So I ended up unemployed and on the dole. But one day playing football on Clapham Common, which is a big common in, in, in London, I kicked a man very hard with his studs right up his shins and he fell to the ground screaming. And a man said to me, do you know who you've just kicked? I said, I've got no idea. He said, this is the most famous sound engineer in the world from Abbey Road Studios. He recorded the Beatles. And I said, hello. <laughs> and I called him up and we would become firm friends. So I started to record at Abbey Road Studios and we made records. Then one day, this is days you cannot imagine these days, ladies and gentlemen. These are the days before mobile phones. Can you imagine that time? So I was appearing, I went, went to Abbey Road Studios to do a recording session. And the, the singer that I had booked was ill. I phoned every other singer that I knew. They were all ill. I then phoned my sister-in-law, who had a friend who knew somebody who was an opera singer. My hopes were this big. The girl came in, she sang, she was an angel. And you're not going to believe this. Four weeks later, the record that we recorded at Abbey Road Studios was number one in Holland. And then in Belgium. And then in France, and then in Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, we were big. Now I want you to come forward with me two years. I'm swank. I am staying in the best hotel room in Paris. The furniture in my hotel room is worth more than I will earn in my life. The telephone goes. I go downstairs. My limousine is waiting. I get into the limousine and the chauffeur says, would sir like to hear a little music? I said, sure. He puts on the radio. It's my record. <laughs> and you know what? The next record that comes on is going to knock my record off number one. Shame, I'd written that as well. <laughs> I am so swank and we're going towards the Tour d'Argent nightclub, the swankiest nightclub in Paris where I'm going to get platinum discs. You'll never guess what happens over the next five minutes. I feel weird, and I'm sitting in the back of this limousine, and I start to cry. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I never went to the Tour d'Argent. I went back to my hotel room, and I decided I was going to give up the music business. Why would that be? And why would I be standing in front of a lot of young people telling you a story of thinking, what on earth is this idiot old man telling me? I'm telling you that the saddest thing in the world is to set yourself up to want to be something that isn't who you are. There is nothing sadder than feeling you've achieved success. Champagne in the veins is what you expected, the neon lights. And all you get is a mouth like a parrot's cage and ashes going through your fingers. So I decided I would change my life. I was going to change my life radically. I was going to lead my life as nobody else that I knew leads their life. I was going to lead my life by falling in love with chaos. You see, when you come to school, you learn things. I hope. You learn all sorts of stuff. But the thing, the reason why this is so cool, the reason I'm here talking to you, is this is one of the most intelligent school projects I've ever come across, because it's actually going to teach you stuff that is about the planet we live on and why it's important to know stuff, not because of knowledge itself, but it is only through understanding your place in the natural world that you suddenly feel alive to who you are. Or else you're just a fake, the great imposter. And believe me, everybody you meet, every successful person I have ever met, have ever met, after they've drunk a glass of wine and they're telling the truth about what they feel, they will tell you they feel like the great imposter. To be happy, you need to be absolutely doing what you want to do. And I hope that that's what you'll be inspired to do here. For me, I decided 
that I was bored, having been at university with people that I thought were going to be really intelligent and clever, to discover that all everybody wanted to do was to smoke dope, to get drunk, to get to know girls, to read enough to get your degree. And then I realised most British people are like that. Most British people are actually fundamentally stupid. They are fundamentally pig ignorant. Shall I tell you why? Do you know the effort of actually thinking, as opposed to putting on the clothes or what everybody else thinks, actually thinking for yourself? I love going to environmental conferences and I go like this and I say, are you anti-nuclear? And of course they think he's an environmentalist. He must be anti-nuclear. And then, I, then I'm cruel. Oh, I enjoy this cruelty. I look them in the eye and say, tell me why you're anti-nuclear. And then they go like goldfish. Because they don't know anything about nuclear. It's because their friends were against nuclear and their friends' friends. And the people who are considered to be really cool are anti-nuclear. It's the same with genetic modification. It's the same with every subject. Unless you've thought about it, you are just a sheep. But how can you stop being a sheep? How can you stop being influenced by the people around you? You know what I did? I have created the most perfect system. And if you learn only one thing today from me, you'll learn a lot from Christopher, he's the learning side of this team. If you learn only one thing from me, it is if you can ride the great horse of chaos, you will be on a ride that will take you places you never dreamt. And you know what you've got to do? You must accept the third invitation you receive without any, any barrier. It doesn't mean you can't accept the first. You see, by saying that you will accept the third, it means that you have to go to places you didn't want to. You see, when you meet oldsters like me, generally, or your parents, or my parents, they will generally say, oh, you must go to university, you must go and do this, and you'll meet the people you need to meet. That's what they'll say. You'll meet the people you need to meet. But magic is never made by meeting the people you need to meet. Magic is made by meeting the people you didn't know you needed to meet. Magic is made by meeting people you didn't know had something to say that could change the way you see life. It happens every time. I accepted a conversation not far distant from here in Taunton. I was going to speak in a Nissan hut. And my PA said, there will be 50 people and a dog. It's not worth it. I said, I've got to go to the third invitation. I went. There were indeed 50 people and a dog. The dog loved my speech. <laughs> and anyway, three months later, I am in Plymouth at a meeting of all of these posh people from Europe who are going to decide the money that the Eden Project will get. We weren't going to get it. We, our faces, did not fit. And suddenly this old man gets up. He says, my name is Humphrey Templey, and I'm the chairman of Somerset County Council. And I saw this man speak in a Nissan hut near Taunton. He obviously loves the West Country, not just the narrow confines of Cornwall. And I have spoken to my colleagues on Taunton County Council, and we have agreed that we are going to cancel one of our projects so that this project may go ahead if all of you will cancel one each as well. That decision to go and speak to 50 people and a dog, you know how much it was worth? 12.7 million pounds. And it happens time after time after time. I have spoken at the West of England Ballroom Championships. I have judged orchid clubs. I've judged dog, dog shows. I've opened old people's homes. But every time you meet the people you weren't meant to meet, and the magic builds, and the stories get bigger, and bigger and bigger. It's the same as the reason I teach my staff. They think I'm mad. I have nine rules of managing my staff. Number one, you must say good morning to 20 people. Number two, you must read two books every year that everybody that knows you would say were completely outside of your interests and review them for your colleagues. Rules three, four, and five, go and see a movie, go and see a show, go and see a play. Same rules. How else are you going to see something that isn't what your mates have already done? How about allowing your brains to really expand by seeing the things that you wouldn't normally do? Hearing the music you wouldn't necessarily listen to. Reading the books you would not, you'd actually walk away from. The effort is magnificent. Rule number six, you must make a speech once a year about why you love working for me. If you can't do it, you've got to go. 
Rule number seven, you've got to do, I don't have the comfort of religion. Rule number seven, you've got to do something unspeakably nice to someone who will never know you did it. It's great fun. Enjoy the pleasure of it. Rule number eight, you must cook for the 40 people that make it worth coming to work. We've narrowed that down because some of our colleagues and cooking are not good friends. <laughs> However, the principle of working by night is really interesting because during daylight hours, we are work person. At night, something weird happens. It's a bit like Dracula, any different. At night, you bring a whole person to the table. Everything you've ever done is now at the table and at the disposal of the team. And it's great. And the last rule is you've got to learn to play samba drums. Typical old hippie, you're probably thinking. Well, I'll tell you something, kids. When you start playing samba drums, they're really difficult. All the rhythms are across the beat. All across the beat. It's only when the last rhythm comes in that suddenly you get this amazing hip swaying quality. Now, why is it that almost every person you've ever met between the age of two and six naturally likes to sing and to dance? And then after that, we get a bit more stiff and just a little bit more shy and we don't sing. You know, you can feel it, can't you? If I pointed at any of you and said, sing now, you're already, your heartbeat's going up, isn't it? Just to get, oh, please God, he's not going to actually do this and point at me. I do, no, I won't. Um, <laughs> so we get these drum guys in, they come in with the big drum, boom, 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 they come in, right? So 50, 50 of my staff are going boom, 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 and they're British. And you know what it's like to be a British drummer? You go, oh, do, do, please don't look at me. This is terribly embarrassing. I can't bear this. There's a vein. I didn't even know there was a vein that goes along here, but they're, they're so stiff like this. And then in come the kibasas, and slowly, the weirdest thing happens. The guys who are doing the big drums at the finger was like this. They suddenly go, oh, funky, that's rather good. You know? And suddenly they all loosen up, they start to scream, they start to holler. And you know what they realize at the end of it? The most important thing of all is what they realize is there is hardly a thrill in the world that gets close to creating something that's bigger than you are. You could not do samba on your own. That excitement, the hair that stands up on the back of your neck is bliss, it's fantastic. It suddenly makes you feel nothing much is impossible. Nothing much. Why am I here? Why am I talking to you? One of my third invitations, I've got to tell you, is one of the weirdest ever. I was told by a friend in America, this really crazy guy is coming to, to London, your London, you know, House Parliament, all that sort of stuff. He's really crazy, but he'd really like to meet you, and I'd like to invite you to meet I said, oh no, you said I'd like to that's going to be my third invitation. So I have to get on the train to London, and I meet this guy who's teetotal in a pub in London near the House of Commons. He has got arms bigger than both of my legs together. His profession used to be a heroin addicted cage fighter. And he had been found on the morgue, on the morgue slab in Chicago General Hospital, waking up from being apparently dead, believing that he had met the Archangel Michael in the afterlife, who'd said, I'm not ready for you. Go back. Go back. And when you go back, you have a mission. Your mission is to protect the giant trees of the west coast of America. So this guy called David Millarch went to find his children who he hadn't spoken to for 25 years. And he cleaned himself up and he went back to the old family farmstead and they went out to the Sierra Nevada mountains of California and they found this, they cut the, they cut the saplings off and they started to propagate these giant sequoias. Now I want you to come on a journey with me. David says, I want you to come climb the biggest tree in the world. Do you know how big this tree is? I'll give you some idea. The stem of this tree, the trunk, would be roughly from where I'm standing to that back wall. It's that big. And you know how you climb the biggest tree in the world? You have to learn how to use a bow and arrow and you put a bit of nylon on the arrow and you're dung over the top branch. It's about 120 feet up, it comes down, you put it tight to a rope, you put it back over that rope and you tie it onto a carabiner and you go ching, 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 ching. And then like an old fashioned railway man, you go like this and get yourself up the tree. And you keep on going. And then finally you get to 300 feet up. You look one way over the Sequoia National Park, which is green as far as you can see. The other way you see Death Valley. It is biblical. 
and your sweaty hands are holding the throat of this tree. You're high up this tree. By the way, by the time you get to the top of a giant sequoia, where at the bottom you can put your hand that deep into its bark, the cracks, at the top it's like the downy feathers of an owl or an eagle. You know those really soft feathers you get just here? And you're holding this tree at the top and suddenly you think of something amazing. And I want you to be with me with this thought. You're holding this damn tree and you suddenly say, it's 4,500 years old. This tree has outlived, to my knowledge as an archaeologist, 37 different civilizations. Think of it. 37 entire civilizations had a beginning, a middle, and then disappeared. And each one of those civilizations will have had people like you in it. Each one. So how did they screw that up then? Go back to what I said before, rule number one, except the third invitation. Read things you're not meant to read. Play things you're not meant to play. Do something unthinkable, which is to think. Because you know the greatest disease in our culture is that you want to belong. You want to be part of the establishment. You can't help yourself. And then you become part of the establishment. You start to agree with what everybody else says. Even though in your heart you don't. You don't want to just be different, so you stay there. So you have an entire civilization marching towards their doom. You know it's true. Just look at our current politicians. I'm not voting for anybody. I didn't mean it as a... What I mean is... What I mean is the freedom to think and be what your heart says you should be should be the main driver. And if you cannot see that working with the grain of nature, that understanding the natural cycles of living things should, should be the start of everything, you're already lost. And then there are all those other values which people don't teach you about being kind, being generous, being trustworthy, having what is called integrity. These are all really important things. They're not nice to have. They're absolutely crucial. It means you're not for sale. I can go to a room anywhere in the world today and I can ask the audience to make a list of the two people that the world knows about or that their country knows about that they most respect. You know what? 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the names on that paper are people who've got one thing and only one thing in common. And it is that they are not for sale for any price. Their values, the integrity is total. Now, I didn't want to come talk to you about the world going to hell in a handcart because actually it isn't. One of the problems is that when you live at a time which has never been so safe as it is now, it's so safe now. I know we hear about people getting murdered and things and whatever. Even my mother believed there were crack dealers on her on her house on her on her drive, and she lived in a posh part of Camberley. You know. And of course when you go to hospital, someone will leave something nasty inside you and you'll get diseases. Everything's terrible. The world is terrible. Is it? It's better than it's ever been. Not necessarily environmentally, but I'm making a point that one of the reasons why we tell ourselves it's so terrible is the same way why every parent in this room up here has imagined the tragedy of the death of their child. It is how Homo sapiens sapiens, the wise ape, copes with dealing with the terrible and the unexpected. You have to use your imagination and through that imagination you build inside you the tactics to be able to protect yourself against the horrible and hopefully never occurring thing that may happen. So actually, I don't think there has ever in the history of humankind been a time as exciting as right now. I am so jealous of you. You have no idea when you're an old bugger at 65, and I look at all of you smart people in the front, you are going to be doing... In 1969, I doubt there's hardly anybody here who's... Yeah, with a few, uh, around 1969. In 1969, we used to... We, there, was a, there was a musical called Hair. Uh, for us chaps, we liked it because the ladies didn't always have as many clothes on as they should have. And it was very exciting, but there was this song, The Age of Aquarius, We Are All Stardust. Just imagine that the world of hippiedom 
and science have gone like this over the time I've been alive. Whereas we understand, and, and Chris is going to be talking about it later, but when you look at the fungal associations in the soil, when you look at the biological, the, the microbial relationships in our stomachs and, and all our bodies, and you start to look at these things, and you suddenly this dawning thought comes to you. Oh my God, we're earthlings. We're earthlings. We're the same thing. We're just like different forms. It's a really exciting time, and you're going to live through this time. I don't think a species could ever have had such an exciting moment as you're all going to have. And what a privilege to be at a school like this that actually studies that stuff so that when you've actually finished it and everybody else is doing really crap things, you know, like studying, you know, sort of media with photography or something. <laughs> I, I, I ought to say with a health warning, for all of you studying media with photography, really good subject. I didn't mean, I didn't mean that. Um, I'm exaggerating to make, make a point. So I'm going to end. I, have I, how long have I talked for so far? Oh, marvellous. I want to tell you about someone really, really cool, and it's going to lead into Christopher, I hope. Either that or he's just going to sort me because I've actually said something he was going to say. I met a most extraordinary man. He's a guy called um, Owen Brennan, and he's very rich. He set up a, an animal feed company called Devonish in, in Ireland, and he bought himself a country estate in southern Ireland in a county called County Meath. And where he's bought it, for any of you who know anything about history at all, it is called Brunia Boinia in Gaelic, the bend in the boin, if you're not uh, 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 of Irish extraction. Um, and there are these three enormous tombs. One is called Newgrange, one is called Douth, and the other is called Nauth. Look them up. These are serious places of death. These are big megalithic tombs, and they're UNESCO World Heritage Site. There are three places that are in Northern Europe that are the tops. There's Karnak in Brittany, Stonehenge in England, and Newgrange in Ireland. He bought the estate that's got Douth on it. And he has, over the last four years, done something absolutely extraordinary. He's spent more money on archaeology on this estate than the whole of the country of Ireland because he wanted to dig up the ground to find out what was underneath. And he found tomb after tomb after tomb. And then he found a dairy dating back five and a half, six thousand years. And he started to research all the pollen in the ground to find what people were eating at the time. And he found all these fish traps in the River Boyne, which was at one time the richest salmon fishing river in Ireland. It was full of freshwater crayfish, um, Salmon, trout, grayling, whatever. It was a, a source of plenty to our ancestors. So he started looking at his soil. He did, he did one thing. He dug a hole because he wanted to dig in an old lime tree because there had once been an avenue of lime trees. And as he dug out the soil, he saw there were no worms at all. And you'll never guess what he did next. He went mad. He went absolutely mad and he went everywhere collecting pig's piss. He went and collected pig's piss from everywhere, gallons and gallons of pig's piss, which he turned into a most amazing cocktail. He took off the ammonia and he injected it all over his land. Then he imported worms. And these worms went crazy. The worms just, they went roilingly mad. And now this estate has just got worms. Worms everywhere. <coughs> Fantastic worms eating the soil and creating most friable soil underneath. Why that's good, he'll tell you. I can't tell you. He's a scientist. He's a good waller. Yeah. What I'm going to tell you has nothing to do with all of this. You think I'm about to tell you all sort of about soil. He, that's his job. But this estate is now really, really... Mwah. He, I forgot to mention, he hasn't restored the building, the stately home. He promised himself he'd do the land first. You will never guess what the first building is that he restored. It's in Ireland. Your life depends on it. What do the Irish like doing? And no, it's not a distillery. <laughs> he restored a racetrack. Why would he restore a racetrack? You should be with me, kids. This is really important. Why would you restore a racetrack in Ireland? Of course you do it because you want your neighbours to come and watch the horse racing, don't you? That's the first thing. First year, 3,000 people came for the horse racing. This year, 7,000 people came for the horse racing. And do you know what the price was to get in? Five minutes. The host demanded five minutes of a silence so pure you could hear a pin drop. And you know what he said? 
year one, he gets up on a table and he looks at all his fellow farmers and he says, my friends, how do you think our ancestors would feel? At which point, theatrically, the side of the tent is ripped off to reveal the huge funeral pile. Our ancestors would be disgusted with us. The thing that was most important to them was the harvest of the river, which married with the harvest of the land. And we have destroyed it. There's hardly anything there. Total silence. These people who had never listened to science in their lives, they knew the truth. There are only four important words. And you know what they are. We are a storytelling ape. We always have been. We've never changed our behaviours because of a fact. But the moment someone starts with these words, once upon a time, we're just captured. We're like a cat being stroked. And we listen. This story has resulted in 30 miles miles of the River Boyne Valley of the farmers who live there changing their agricultural practices so they don't leach anything into the River Boyne. And guess what? The grayling are returning, the trout are returning, the salmon are returning, and they found freshwater shrimp. Cool, huh? What you need, the reason I'm saying this is because Christopher's going to be telling you about the excitements of science in a way that I cannot, but as you study the measurability of the life around us, if we're going to actually be able to act in time to delight in a planet that has everything that we could ever wish for, we have to, as well as understanding the science, understand the power of story. So never forget, once upon a time. It is not that science and the arts are different things. I hate science. I loathe science. I... Have you any idea the hatred I could have for science? Do you know when it was invented, that science stuff? I can tell you exactly. 1834 is when it was first used. And do you know what happened then? Natural philosophy, which is basically what you're going to be studying here, which is about looking at it all, the in the round, the big picture, no, no, the word science was the moment that Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. He had a big fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him together again. Your job is to put Humpty Dumpty together again, to tell stories with the science all together, so we can actually understand that big picture. That's what I say about the Eden Project, that's what we're about. We're about trying to find the glue for Humpty Dumpty. Because you know the thing underneath that, my slight joke about science. Do you know what actually happened? What actually happened is by 1867, the word natural philosophy wasn't heard again, except in terms of what old timers used to do. Because what was happening was these people called scientists, they'd broken it down to become ologists and ismists. So you had biology and chemistry and zoology and all of the ologies broken down into ever smaller bits and they were consuming knowledge to make it theirs. I deal with scientists all the time and there is nothing sadder than watching a scientist who's a real expert on the outside wing flap of a fruit fly. And then you ask them to put it in perspective of climate change and they go, oh. you have to send them to samba dancing classes, it's the only way. But I want, I, want, I want to finish by saying, I wish I was you. You have no idea of the privilege you have being in a place that is dedicated to this subject. Gosh, I wish I had been at such a place. So don't screw it up, guys. Don't screw it up. I mean, I know it's really difficult getting up in the morning and all that sort of stuff, and there are loads of other cool things to attach you, but to have this opportunity to start the careers of the future are all being made now in this area of agronomy. You see, I'll finish by saying, you know, I was talking about nuclear power. Have you noticed how when we're going to have an Extinction Rebellion riot, we're going to talk about flying? Flying. Everybody talks about flying in cars. Why? Because most people aren't smart enough to realise terrorists always take planes, don't they? The plane is a symbol of something, right? It's not that I'm advocating flying, but when you look at agriculture, 41% of all of the carbon emissions on the whole planet come from poor agriculture. 
the things we eat, the way we grow, the way we cultivate. This is about thinking. Coming here is about testing yourself, about how smart are you. And last of all, I, I made a joke about it before, but if we are worthy as we head into a very uncertain time of that phrase, homo sapiens sapiens, so wise we called ourselves it twice, it is worth asking what is the weaponry you need to arm yourself with. I think sharp wits, not taking anything for granted, being trustworthy, and actually asking yourself this one question. If someone said to you, your relationships with the people you loved were sustainable, how exciting is that? Sustainability is the shittest word ever invented. <laughs> it really is. We should be talking about joy, beauty, life-affirming things. That way it's a lot more exciting. You are on the verge of making environmental interest rock and roll. Don't waste it with lousy language, bad food and bad music. Thank you very much.